All right. Good evening, everybody. Oh, didn't turn this one on. I didn't turn this one on. There we go. Well, I don't have to now. <laughs> and if I talk too loud, then this other mic will blast the people online. So good evening, everybody. It is 1930. Let's go ahead and gather around. Glad to see so many people here in the room. Glad to see several people online. Welcome, welcome. And we will go ahead and get things started with our Pledge of Allegiance. We have a flag right over here. Sorry, those of you online, it's, it's over there. Just face the screen. Remove your covers if you're wearing them and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, indivisible, indivisible liberty, justice liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, we are uh, live on the air on both Zoom and we are broadcasting to our uh, YouTube channel. I don't, we'll see if anybody watches that too. Uh, the thing with YouTube is it's not very interactive. So uh, if you're able to join the Zoom, please do so. And better yet, come join us in person. We are back to pre-COVID. All right. So anybody here for the first time in the room, first time visitor? Nope. Online. Anybody first time? Charlie, you're not here for the first time. <laughs> okay. Uh, brand new hams or license upgrades in the room or online? Nope. Okay. Uh, those of you online, well, I'll wait for Ted to finish connecting. Uh, let's see. Announcements. Uh, Escondido Amateur Radio Society has their annual auction. It is coming up on May 13th. That's a Saturday. Uh, doors open at 9 a.m. Auction begins at 10 a.m. It's outside in a parking lot, uh, 320 East 4th Avenue, Escondido, California. Uh, it's, let's see. Oh, it's uh, Dirk's parking lot. Okay. Uh, more info can be found at earsclub.org, and I will have this flyer on the table down there by the computer, and uh, it'll be in the May uh, scope as well. So uh, anybody in the room can take a picture of it down there, and uh, otherwise you can go to earsclub.org online and get info or look in the next scope. Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't see Joe Ashley for testing dates. Does anybody know anything about testing dates coming up? The 29th? Okay. Okay. Fourth Saturday. Okay. Um, so if you know anybody who wants to get their tech or an upgrade, that'd be a good opportunity for that. I don't see... San Marcos on the third Saturday. Oh, the Papa system. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I was going to give Joe N6JO a chance to talk about Oceanside CERT because I know that they're really pushing to have an academy coming up, but I don't see him on either. Uh, okay. We got an alert from uh, Hamtest Online that they are closing down shop. Yeah. Um, that was a for-profit, and apparently they haven't been <laughs> profiting for several years. Uh, he is willing to sell. He won't let it go extremely cheap, and it's been losing money anyways. So um, I, I sent him an email, had a little conversation, and I sent an email to the board. Nobody responded to it, so I think we're probably going to pass on that. Uh, that would be pretty complicated for a Nonprofit to own a for profit or whatever. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, if you're interested in a business adventure that may or may not make some money, talk to me and I can get you in contact with the right people. Uh, committee chair reports. We'll start with modernization. Charlie, do you want to talk to us? Yeah. Um... A lot of the uh, 
report is contained in this month's book. Uh, <clears throat> if you read it, you saw the condition as in as the month of February ended. Um, we got hammered by the snow on Palomar Mountain, so we can't. We didn't do much work up on the mountain. However, we shifted a lot of the integration down here to the valley. Got a lot done. Uh, thanks to uh, Mark and John Weaver and Glenn and uh, Jim Watson, all of that integration work has now migrated to the site. And now we can log on from any website, from any web location in the world and control the controllers. Pretty soon, all of the repeaters will be controlled worldwide for resetting, testing, funny noises, all of that stuff. In addition, we had a chance, uh, thanks to Mark, who took his, um, his uh, drone and took a bunch of pictures of the existing tower. It is in bad shape. And it needs a lot of work. We didn't scope in our effort the refurbishment of the entire tower. We mentioned refurbishing some antennas. What we have done, there's an antenna in the frost bar that's ready to fall off the tower in any heavy weather. And we funded Mark and uh, John Fleminen to build all the stainless steel material needed to retighten that antenna. That we, the flub has a long way to go on that one. And other than that, we are moving speedily right ahead. You saw the schedule in the uh, scope, and we're pretty much on track. Great. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Um, for those of you online, I was going to say this earlier, but some people were not on the audio yet. Uh, please change your name, if you can, to your first name and your call sign so we can uh, properly get attendance uh, for those, of those that are online. And in person here, the sign-in sheet is over by the donuts. If you're online, sorry, we got donuts. Come back to the meetings. Okay. Uh, Glenn, membership chair, please. Okay, um, well, a while back, like uh, two months ago, I realized that we have a lot of members that have signed up for annual um, re auto renewals through PayPal, and that's been a great help. The payment comes in on the day their membership would otherwise lapse, and I just have to record it. Um, we've also had uh, three new members in the last couple of months, um, two in February, but uh, I didn't get them recorded until after the meeting. So one is named Lendl. His call sign is Kilo Alpha 9 Hotel Charlie Papa. We have Roy uh, Whiskey Bravo 9 R uh, <laughs> Rate Romeo Kilo November. Uh, obviously, these are people coming from other zones. And uh, Mike joined uh, last week. His call sign is AJ6 GK. And uh, we, so we, <laughs> another John, his name's not John, but close. Mike's pretty popular too. Um, and so we currently have 152 paid up memberships. 
Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and a reminder that the uh, renewal and entering that into the database is a manual process that Glenn has to go through. So when you pay via PayPal or your auto renew goes through, it's not, it doesn't show up on the website instantaneously. Mark. So Mark is our repeater site and technical chair, and he will give us the report on the site. And the reason why I messed you up a little bit on your order is I thought I'd go get some of the parts that are falling off the tower. <laughs> Tell the microphone so people online can this, hear you. This is, if you guys remember, up on the left, there's a, a corner cube with a bow tie in front of it. And this is half the bow tie, which I found on the ground. For those of you who don't know, the the site is about 5,380 feet up, something like that. And uh, we've got some gorgeous pictures of our tower with completely horizontal icicles coming off of it due to the 100 mile an hour winds that we get on top of the mountain. And uh, last time, the time before, I found half of a dish that was for amateur TV. And then I happened to look the last time because my car was parked directly underneath the tower and the other half of the dish was swinging back and forth in the breeze. So I just got out and moved my car about 20 feet further away. So just for fun, a couple of you guys know I've got a little mini drone that I bought mostly for doing work like this. So I flew it up there and uh, because if I don't know if some of you have seen it yet, one of our main bow tie, or, uh, excuse me, main uh, four bay antennas is now leaning on an angle against another four bay antenna. And it hasn't come down yet because if it does, it's gonna be bad. So I went up with the drone and I started looking at the clamps and the clamps went up there in 1984. They're mild steel and now they're corroded through mild steel. So John, wherever he's at, has a piece of 304 stainless plate that I asked him to machine. And we're making clamps. For those of you who don't know, I started my career designing ICBMs and tactical nukes, the space station, the space shuttle, and a whole bunch of stuff for DARPA that we can't talk about. So I know all about overbuilding stuff. That's the definition of government in space. So uh, I'm currently building, or uh, having John in this case, build 304 stainless clamps because the clamps that hold the entire horizontal sections of the tower are corroding through. They're not gone yet, but when if they go, they're gonna rip enough heliax out of that tower that we're gonna be down for weeks and weeks provided we go up every day or two. So we're building that as fast as we can get it done. I'm going to make a quick run up, shoot a little bit more uh, pictures and video this weekend. And then next weekend, hopefully, we're going to have the tower climbing project. We'll all go up to the top or whoever can climb. We'll go up to the tower and we'll get this thing to the point where at least those clamps and those crossbars won't come down in any of our lifetimes. With what regard to what Charlie was talking about, um, we've rep replaced the little homeowner router that's really cute, the little Asus router, uh, with a commercial router that's running separate VPN pipes to each output port. And we've got ports, and you, you use public and private keys to get into that router and through it. And the, with the good work that uh, John and Jim were doing, mostly in this, this part of it, John, uh, we now have that router installed. I put a power bus in for it. Everything's on the, UP, on the battery backup system, or it will be by Saturday, because I got to get that one more cable in for that router. And I'll put in the little mini rack to put it on the wall, blah, blah, blah. Long and short of it is, uh, the modernization team is making good progress. The bad news, Mr. President of the club, is the modernization team allocated 200 bucks to fix the tower so far. I blew by that right away. 
And you know, I'm a firm believer in asking forgiveness rather than permission. So what I decided is if I don't get the money, I'm going to take all my parts and go home. And when the tower comes down, you got to call somebody else. Anyway, I, he never has said no in how long we've we been doing this? 10 years? He's, he's never argued with me, especially on important things. Keeping the tower up in the air, I think that's a pretty important thing. Yeah, anyway, um, all the repeaters are behaving themselves. Uh, and the last but not least, what Charlie was talking about on the control computer is mounted on the wall. It's good to go. You can log into it remotely. Now I got to run cables between the control computer, computer and each of the SCOM repeater controllers. And then I don't have to go up the mountain anymore or sit there with a DTMF keypad to control the repeaters any longer. So I'm looking forward to that. Did I miss anything, Charlie? or John, or who, Joe, or, no? Yes, I am here. You Mark. want to see what half of an antenna looks like? I got one. Yes, Charlie. Just so there's no confusion. You said you didn't have the money. You do have the money from the modernization project. Now, other money is a different story. We'll, we'll figure it out at the yeah, board yeah, meeting. Charlie, I'm, not too I'm, I'm not too worried. I oh. know where everybody lives. I know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Mark. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. That's the reports. Uh, John? Oh. And for anybody who knows me, the Tesla is up and crawling again. Mark is announcing that the Tesla is back, and my Jeep will be delivered back to me tomorrow. Somebody let, ran into the front left wheel of my Jeep a year and a quarter ago. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's see. Great. Um, goody table. John, I see some stuff back there that you probably don't want to take home. Probably not because the people in online can't can't take the goody table stuff anyways. Okay, thanks, John. So yeah, those of you online, you're, you're seeing that the uh, goodie table is back in full swing and we have donuts and we have a Keurig here with coffee, uh, leaded and unleaded, hot chocolate and uh, cider. Wait, what? I said cider. <laughs> Nobody's drinking the coffee. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go back and have either a cider or a hot chocolate here when I, when I pass this off, okay. Uh, your board of directors, Mark is your repeater chair, KF6WTN. Keith is your scope editor, KM6CXW. John is your uh, one of your directors, uh, W6XM. Ron is your other director, AJ6FQ. Uh, Glenn is your membership chair, uh, AI6RR. Jim is your treasurer, K2VO. Are you here, Jim? No. Okay. I have money for Jim. So uh, another Jim is your secretary, W6TQS. Chris is your vice president, KD9LF. And I am your president, Joe K6JPE. Uh, Chris, do you want to do the intro or do you want me to just do a little? Okay. So Chris is your uh, program director as the vice president, and uh, he would welcome suggestions of programs that you want to see, or if you have a program that you would like to present. Talk to him and he will get you on the schedule. Thank you. I'm also in charge of the donuts. It's actually a lot more important than any speakers, <laughs> as I've learned since this is the second time and it's the most popular thing I've ever done. Um, 
Tonight is my pleasure to introduce Bob Birch, who's disaster services team lead for the uh, San Diego Imperial County uh, chapter of the Red Cross. It's a huge chapter and uh, we have a lot of equipment and a lot of responsibility for uh, disasters um, all over the county. Uh, Bob, it's not just radios, it's uh, computers and other communication equipment. Bob's with, uh, been with the Red Cross for over 40 years. He's been an amateur radio operator for over 20 and uh, it's, uh, he's a great leader for uh, that group. So without further ado. Pelican. Oh, and Bob used to be the treasurer of this club. Yeah, I recognize a few faces from when I was a uh, treasurer. And uh, tonight, what I'm going to do is uh, give you a little bit of uh, idea of what the Red Cross actually does locally. You hear about the Red Cross nationally when we have these big disasters, Hurricane Ian and tornadoes and stuff, floods in Northern California. But a lot of people don't know what we do day-to-day uh, -day locally here in uh, San Diego County. So we'll start off with, well, let's see here. Maybe we will. Let's see if I turn it on up, oh, that's fine. All right, well, that'll work. Uh, start off with what the mission of the Red Cross is. The American Red Cross is a humanitarian organization led by volunteers. And that's a key word. Most of us are in the Red Cross is 90% volunteers. <clears throat> led by volunteers and guided by the congressional charter and the fundamental principles of the International Red Cross uh, will provide relief to victims of disaster and help people prevent, prepare for and respond to emergencies. So let's see if we can get it to move this time. There we go. These are some of the programs that we offer here locally. We have health and safety. We have uh, CPR, first aid, uh, uh, water safety classes, um, babysitting uh, classes for young folks that will be doing babysitting. We have blood services. We do service to the armed forces, which is a, a nationwide program. We have disaster preparedness classes. So get ready, San Diego. So that if you're ready, then that's something we don't have to worry about preparing for uh, going down. And then the, this one other one, Sound the Alarm. It's a program that's been going on for quite a few years. And we just had a big event uh, last Saturday. What is Sound the Alarm? The Red Cross is working nationwide to prevent home fire deaths. And we are going around the nation. And we did, again, uh, Spring Valley last Saturday. We install free smoke alarms. So anybody that has an old smoke alarm needs to be replaced. These are 10-year uh, battery smoke alarms. They sit down and they also work with you to create a, a uh, evacuation plan where you can get out of your, your residence in under two minutes. And we have found and documented here in San Diego from the alarms that we have installed in San Diego, we have, we have saved five lives. And most of those are in mobile homes because they go up like a matchbox. But we've been very fortunate to save uh, five lives from smoke alarms that we put in. Last Saturday, we actually installed 340 smoke alarms in, uh, in Spring Valley area. And that's our national one week, every chapter across the nation puts in you know, this effort to a mass uh, approach on smoke alarm installs. But we also do uh, what we call hot shots. So if you need a smoke alarm, you know, you know somebody that needs a smoke alarm, go to redcross.org, search for home fire campaign, and you also can have a free smoke alarm, uh, and, you know, free smoke alarms installed in your residence. The other thing we do have for those that are uh, hard of hearing or sight, we have bed shakers. So that, you know, somebody who, you know, can't hear the smoke alarm, the bed will shake. So in those situations, we have those as well. So anyway, great program. We, we love doing it. And it's, we had 138 volunteers 
uh, last Saturday, going around and installing smoke alarms. We also manage the Women, Infant, and Children program. It's a nourishment program. It's a federal program, but uh, ran by the states. And here in uh, San Diego, we are the administrators of the, the WIC program. And then, of course, disaster services. And disaster services is what we'll spend most of our time on this evening. Here in San Diego, we have what we call DAP teams, disaster action teams. And every 26 hours, we respond to something. Now, whether it's a home fire, apartment fire, uh, flooding, uh, any reason where a person cannot stay in their residence, uh, we will go in with our DAP teams. We will help out and get, uh, get them a place to stay, uh, get them a, you know, food, uh, clothing if they need it, if it was destroyed. And it's, it's those hours, you know, it goes on 24 hours a day. Uh, last Saturday alone, we actually had two uh, fires uh, in a residence and an apartment from electric bikes. The lithium ion battery caught you know, two, two residences on fire just last Saturday. So what do we do? We provide shelter and uh, feeding for our disaster clients. That could be a mass shelter. That might be in a, uh, a gymnasium or a church uh, gymnasium where we put lots of cots up. We provide meals, three meals a day, uh, a place, you know, safe place and a warm place for people to, to stay. Or it could be we work to get them in a, a hotel. The idea is we don't want them left on the street. Uh, the, the thing we try to work forward to is placing them with a friend or family so that if they've just lost their house, they're gonna have some emotional and it's nice to have a friend or family you can uh, kind of work through it with. Also, we send volunteers all over the nation. Uh, as of Sunday, I, when I looked at our, our chart, I haven't looked at it today, we had 1,300 volunteers around the nation responding uh, to the uh, floods still going on up in uh, Northern California. That is not, you know, not closed for us. You know, the flooding has somewhat reci uh, re recited, but we still are doing a uh, long-term recovery there. The tornadoes are just gonna add to that. So I, I guarantee you that number is no longer 1,300. It's more than that. So, and as a Red Cross volunteer, uh, if you would decide to become a Red Cross volunteer and you would like to go to some not so exotic places and sleep on cots and not in the best conditions, you know, we certainly could use you because we, between Hurricane Ian and all these, we've exhausted a lot of our volunteers. So it's, it's a big need. We also work with the clients to do a long-term recovery. We work with not just the Red Cross, but other uh, partner groups, nonprofits, government organizations to help the folks get back to some semblance of what normal is after you've, you've lost everything. And then for most of it, we're gonna talk about disaster services technology. That's what I'm the volunteer lead for. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Anything that revolves around technology falls into our activity. So we do communications. What is communications? It could be uh, radios. And we've got some go kits I'll talk about in a bit. So we are responsible for establishing, maintaining a communication system, however that may be, whether that be amateur radio, commercial type radios, cell phones, uh, anything that we can do. We, got, we have satellite uh, dishes that we can bring in from our, our uh, disaster service center. And like I say, just about everything. And then computer operations. And we spend more time doing computer ops because when we open up a shelter, we go in and we set up computers so that we, they can get on, our, our workers can get on the internet and, and get uh, put in information on a lot of the Red Cross systems that are on the internet. It, everything's in the cloud uh, now. So our biggest challenge is providing a communication to the cloud. Uh, we also set up networking. You know, we, we've done on this one corner up here, this is a, a, a cradle point with a, uh, with a ubiquity WAP that we set up. And fortunately we were able to just keep those two together, but the, but the ubiquity could go hundred feet away if we had a big facility to create internet. Inside the cradle point are two different cell cards. Uh, we also have the ability to connect in one of our satellites into the cradle point. And then uh, customer service, 
Red Cross, have, we, we, we have quite a bit of technology and equipment. It's located in Douglasville, Georgia. So when we fly this stuff out uh, and you know we've got say 300 volunteers here in say San Diego, for example, during some of the wildfires, then uh, we have to make sure we get all that equipment back to Douglasville. So we have to keep track of it. Who took it, you know, who's, you know, who signed for it, make sure that it gets back uh, inventoried and returned back to the uh, uh, fulfillment center. This is some of the list of some of the equipment we have in our disaster logistics fulfillment center, what we call it, the LFC. And we've got just, we've got everything that uh, we could possibly need. Need. Unfortunately, it's on the East Coast. It's in Georgia. So we have to make sure we get our request in early. If we even think, if we have a disaster starting up and we think we might have a need for equipment, we immediately put in that request because they got to process it. They got to get it uh, pulled out of inventory. They test it, check it, send it on uh, Federal Express and get it out to us. And you know, if we need it the next day, it's a real challenge. Most of the time, it's going to be at least two to three days before we get it. So we kind of have to hold our own for the first 72 hours locally here. And we do have some equipment that we can, they can work with. We'll go through some of that. We also have, and you've all have seen this, we actually had that set up at uh, field day when we were out there in San Marcos where the DMV was when we used to set up field day out there. We have our communications trainer. Uh, we continue to maintain it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great asset, great resource for us to have here. And on the front end, we've got uh, a 5.5 kW uh, propane generator with two uh, tanks on it. And we know we can get uh, 11, 12 hours with full, pulling full power out of the trailer with the air conditioner running. So we know we have about you know, 22, 24 hours worth of uh, power on the front. And then we have a big a bank, a couple of uh, good sized batteries with a inverter. Uh, so we can probably go another 10 hours uh, just off the battery. And we would of course have to drop the air conditioner and a few other things and, and uh, uh, to keep ourselves operating in a, a prime condition. On that front of that trailer, we also have the capability of putting in a 20 foot mast uh, that we can put up into the air to get out uh, further if, if needed. This is our rack. This, this communications rack is not only a radio rack with uh, all the radios in it, but it's also a network center or uh, anywhere where we need to, to have the network communication. So uh, it, it does, uh, on top antennas. This is uh, the inside operational, uh, one of the positions in the far corner is a digital uh, station. Uh, it, it, there we can also print things if need be. Uh, the radio operating position, we have two tough books, two Panasonic uh, tough books. This is the equipment that's inside the comps trailer and we keep adding more to it and taking some stuff out. Uh, we've uh, recently added a DMR radio and that actually goes with us because uh, we actually have a, recently acquired a, uh, a DMR portable repeater so that we can deploy this digital portable repeater uh, for, for DMR. Although we're not, as, we're not as sold on DMR as we first were. Uh, it's because it's still internet based. Uh, this is our radio room. We have five positions in our radio room uh, and position one and position three are exactly exactly the same set up everything set up exactly the same so if you had to move from position one to position three you shouldn't skip a beat because they're exactly the same the position two is our hf station 
Uh, we do. We have two dipoles on the roof, uh, north, south, east, west dipole, and we can switch between the two. And we also have a vertical uh, antenna for HF uh, on the roof. And then our we have a station which is our disaster assessment. They're responsible for um, listening to the scanner, picking up any information on ev evacuations or the, the condition of what is going on so that we can feed that into our operations staff to keep, keep going forward. Uh, we also have a, uh, a packet station there inside the, uh, the uh, radio room. And then with the fifth position is kind of like the, the, the lead of the operation. So if one of the positions gets overwhelmed with traffic, then the supervisor lead can pick up any of the excess uh, traffic in the radio room. And if you ever get a chance to go down to San Diego, for any, you know, we always meet the first Saturday of every month from nine till noon. Uh, we have a, what we call a ch chapter disaster operations center. It'll rival any uh, emergency operations center in the county. Uh, the capabilities of that are just absolutely amazing. Uh, and we can push audio, video, and all all kinds of things all over the uh, the building. So again, this is some of the stuff we have in the uh, the radio room. Now our go kits. I brought some go kits with me. Uh, each one of these kits, we have VHF, we have HF, and then we have HT kits. Didn't bring any of the HT kits, they're pretty basic. But with each kit also has a power box. So when you, and we, we send out, there's an antenna bag and it's, big and bulky and I didn't want to bring it as well, but uh, we'll, sh we'll talk about what's inside of each of those. So these are really cool. Uh, some of the th things that we wanted to do when we started building these, nothing over 40 pounds. We wanted them to be semi lightweight so we could move them around and, and not have to have two people or hurt, hurt somebody's back trying to move them around. We wanted to be modular. So, you know, if we, the power box as an example can go either way. It can go to an HF or it can go to a VHF. It's, it's absolutely exactly the same as you would use for either kit. So there's no, oh, that's only a VHF power box or that's an HF power box. It, they're, they're the same. Uh, they're infrastructure independent and we don't need, whoops. We don't need uh, you know, the, as amateur radio is, I mean, that's what amateur radio is for, is, is infrastructure independent. And we fight the same battle as a lot of other uh, organizations do, is everybody's tied to their cell phone. They just don't think they're going to need amateur radio until the time comes. And it will come. There's no doubt. Uh, we kind of proved that to a degree on the Border 32 fire last year. It was out there at Mountain Empire High School. They had no cell service, you know? So it's like, okay, now what are you gonna do? Uh, so it, it, it's tough to break these people uh, from their cell phones. And I try to tell them, hey, if we can work stuff through radio, when you, when you call somebody on your cell phone, the only person that knows about that conversation is you and the person you were talking to. All the other people could, could use that information that you were talking about, and you wouldn't have to keep repeating it multiple times. So uh, we fight that battle, it, it, we'll get there. Uh, all of them had to be multi-mode capable, easy to set up and deploy, uh, maximum flexibility. And our goal was only to cover San Diego and Imperial counties. That's all we really needed you know, to worry about. But what we have found with the HF kit, we can go a lot further. Uh, we've held field day down at uh, our chapter headquarters and we've gotten as far as Kansas City, just using this HF kit and a random wire with three ground radials. And it's amazing what we've been able to do. Uh, we continue to, to train on them. And just uh, about two months ago, we talked to an individual that a lot of you uh, know. And um, well, I'll show you his picture here in a minute. And it'll ring through. So what do we have? We have HF, VHF, we have power boxes, and we have HT kits. The idea was to be able to do voice communications and digital communications. And what we put in there in these, this HF kit 
is an SCS modem. Love them. You know, they're, they're not cheap. They're about, last time I looked, they're like $1,200. But it's amazing how they get the message through. Uh, you can have very, very weak signal, and that SCS modem will still punch it through or pull it out. It's, they're really, really amazing uh, uh, modems. We also use two meter single uh, sideband because we don't have a lot of extra class, general class licenses. We got a lot of, we got a lot of techs that are, that are new and they can use two meter uh, single sideband. Uh, you know, and we have an elk log periodic antenna in the antenna bags. So we have the random wire. We put the log periodic on top of the, 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 uh, the pole, the painter pole. We actually string that random wire between two painter poles. And I've got some pictures I'll show you. And we can then do uh, two meter single sideband and we, you know, it's directional. So we can, you know, we've got a, a GPS with all of the different repeater sites and our chapter headquarters in the GPS. So if I know where I'm at and I need to talk and I need to make, you know, voice communications simplex to say San Diego, I can then take the GPS and say, okay, I need to point the antenna that direction and then use the log periodic uh, elk antenna to, to make that, that connection. And we also have a uh, cross band repeat, although we don't use that uh, very often. So in the HF kit, we have an a, uh, Yesu uh, 897. Uh, it's been a great radio. Uh, we've, we've been very happy with it. We have uh, the 30 watt power supply uh, on the bottom of it as well. Uh, we have the SCS modem. We have a backup with the SignalLink USB sound card. We have an SG230 uh, smart tuner inside. We have, again, the log periodic uh, antenna. We have a tri band antenna. And then, of course, the random wire. And we have a netbook computer that goes with, with each one. Also in the box is a, a headset and a foot pedal. So that, you know, we're going to be in, could most likely be in noisy environments. So the headset is what we rely on to make sure we have a, a good, good signal or good, good sound quality. The VHF kit is the uh, Yesu 8900 uh, with a you know, power supply 1223, a Cantronics uh, a KPC3 Plus, a network computer, a log periodic, and then a Comet uh, 510 antenna. That's in the VHF kit. And the HT kits, we're using a VX6R transceivers right now, uh, handhelds. We're probably going to switch those out. We've got some Anytone 878 radios, and we love those radios for the capabilities of what you can, you can do with it. So well, we're going to swap out the VX6Rs for the, the 878s, uh, at least for some of the kits that we have. Then we have a Comet uh, SMA small antenna. Uh, we have a log periodic antenna, uh, you know, painter pole headset. We have the Heil headsets and, and some spare batteries. That's in the HD kits. Inside the uh, power box, we just, we used to have 35 amp hour AGM batteries. Uh, they'd, do, they'd seen their better life. And so we've just now in the last year switched over to the Bieno uh, 20 amp hour uh, LiFO battery. And we have uh, the super power gate chargers, uh, but we know that the charger that's in this one is not designed or made to charge lithium ion battery. The new chargers are very expensive. So we just bought the charger for the battery. So we just charge the battery off of the Bieno uh, a charger at this point. Eventually we will uh, replace the power gates with the proper ones so that the operators don't have to worry about um, switching connectors and putting them in the right place. So, but, you know, volunteer organization, nonprofit, you live with what you got. And we're very fortunate to have what we, we have. And then everything plugs into a rig runner and you know, you'll see it on, on the front end there. So this is a group of folks that assembled them. You'll, you should recognize a couple of faces up there. Uh, Tom Martin, uh, K6 RCW, uh, used to own uh, Rancho Bernardo uh, Glass and Mirror. And he uh, packed up and moved to Texas. I've talked to him a few times 
Uh, haven't talked to him in the last few days to see how he survived. Loving it back there. Uh, has no intentions of ever coming back to California. He is um, uh, out in the remote. He's got himself a nice uh, big tower up in the air. I forget the, the size of the tower. So he's just happy as hell. Uh, you know, he couldn't do that here where he, where he was at in California. He could put a tower up. So he's playing all kinds of radio stuff. And then, you know, of course, on the far corner, there's Rich and I-6H. Uh, again, all both long-term uh, Palomar Club members when they were around. Rich is now out in Marietta. And then a, a few of the other folks that, that, that helped put it together. We continuously train on them. It's great to have all the equipment, but if you don't train on them, then it's worthless. And we found that out because during COVID, we weren't allowed to meet in person. The Red Cross says, nope, everything's gotta be virtual. Uh, so we didn't touch these kits for about a year and a half, almost two years. And when we did sit down and, and have a, our, our monthly meeting and said, okay, let's go put up the, the HF kit. It took us a while to kind of figure out how to make the computer, talk to the radio and the radio, talk to the SCS modem. So we have forgotten a lot of things. So we try to do a practice exercise minimum of, of three times a year. Three of our meetings every year is using the go kits so that we don't lose that, that knowledge that we you know, need to make these things operate. There's a complete set of instructions on the inside. Uh, so, you know, you can sit and read the instructions and make it work, but it's a much better deal if you could get it done quickly. You know, they don't, if there's things going on, you don't need to be sitting, you know, reading instructions to get it working. Uh, you need to be able to do it and do it in, in a heartbeat. So here's our setup. The X is actually up in uh, Calavera Park. Uh, we set it up out there and you can see the Painter poles, we had uh, two painter poles and with the, with, the pol with PVC base, those bases are just PVC, you know, pushed together. And then the S, uh, SG-230 tuner and, you know, stretched out uh, through, the, uh, through the park. And then we had our little setup on the side with our netbook, our notebook computer and, and the, uh, the go kit set up. And we, we did both voice and digital. Uh, training on that. And uh, again, very happy with how well these kits actually work. And again, a lot of it has to do with this SCS modem. Of course, when you're out in the sunlight, it's kind of hard to, uh, to see the computer screen, especially these old, we always get hand-me-downs. We don't get anything new. You know, uh, in fact, we have uh, 16 uh, laptops that we were able to acquire. The, the chapter was going through a, a refresh program and they were getting ready to send all these laptops off to recycle. And we just kind of found a new home for them. We hijacked them and pulled them in and, and we had to re-image them. We uh, had to buy new batteries. Uh, we replaced all the hard drives in them with SSDs, solid state drives to try and make them last as long as we can, because we know we're not gonna get, you know, replacements when they die, we just go down in numbers. Uh, unless we can work hard to get a grant from somebody to, to restock. It's not gonna come from national headquarters. We're gonna have to just survive on our own. So we may do with what we can. You can see the log periodic on the far corner over there, uh, sitting on top of the, uh, the, the random wire. Uh, so we tested all those things. We, we tested uh, single sideband. Of course, Lake, the Calavera Park, it didn't work so well. We were not able to do a single sideband with our chapter headquarters because uh, we sat kind of in a little bit of a hole and we weren't able to, to get out. But all of, we actually set up uh, three stations, us and two other, uh, one in East County, one in South Bay. And we had people at our chapter headquarters and we tested it to make sure that it work. We now have a group uh, finally out in Imperial Valley. Uh, Jay Rollins out there, who is the lead for the ACS organization and Aries out there. We finally got their group uh, working with us and we just delivered an HF kit and a VHF kit and a couple of laptops out to Imperial Valley. 
because if something major happens, we're not going to get up over the hill. They're going to be they're going to be on their own for a while. That's just that's just the way it is. And so it's nice to have a group of folks out there. So we went out last month and did some training, trained a group of uh, six people on how to use the HF kit. And then two weeks later, they had a meeting and deploying the HF kit was their meeting. So they had another 10 people. So we got a you know, decent group of folks out there that can, can, can deploy the kits. So that's pretty much what we have down here in San Diego. We, we definitely uh, uh, could use more volunteers if you have the desire to do things technology and, and volunteer some time. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me. Uh, you can send me an email at uh, my home email address is rrbirch, B-I-R-C-H, at cox.net. Pretty easy and simple. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, we get to do a lot of different things. And we, we have, you know, been called out and helping people in some of their darkest times. And, uh, you know, when people are evacuated from their homes, then, uh, and you're able to go in there and help them. It's, uh, it's a huge relief on their part. And uh, we're able to, to provide the technology that we need to, to support them. So do we have any questions? Okay, right there, yep. Uh, FEMA kind of comes in after. Red Cross is like, we're, we're, the, we're not first responders, you know, but we are some of the first on the scene uh, to open up shelters or things of that nature. Now, FEMA comes in after the fact, and we, and we open up shelters with partner groups as well. Uh, like in Carlsbad here, we actually had some training for shelter managers with the recreational staff. I mean, who better than these, the people who manage the recreational uh, services of Carlsbad? You know, they, they'd be great shelter managers. So we've done that. We've done churches that we've teamed up with to provide shelter managers. So the, we know we can't do it alone. Uh, FEMA, FEMA comes in with the reinforcements and, and, and money, <laughs> you know, fortunately. Uh, but, you know, again, for us, we don't draw on a lot of that, that FEMA. It's, it's the American people supporting the American people. You know, that's what, it is. That's, what the, you know, that's what the Red Cross is. There are some things where FEMA steps in and then can alleviate, but you know, we provide meals and, and places to stay, uh, a shelter uh, in Florida, maybe four weeks ago. And that was in uh, Fort Myers, if, if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, Far back. Things. Uh, we store some of it in our communications trailer. Uh, we have this, these are backup. These are backup boxes. The boxes that, are, that we know we have to deploy are maintained and stored in our uh, communications trailer. We have a group that comes in every Wednesday. They do maintenance on the trailer. They charge the. Uh, the power boxes uh, rotate through. They do the same thing on the laptops. They rotate. We have four cases of four. So they rotate through and charge the laptops uh, every week. So by the time a month is over with, they'll all have been charged. Then we take the battery out of the laptop because we found that, that we were getting a, a parasitic draw on the laptop. So now we take the batteries out to, to eliminate that parasitic draw. We would charge a battery and a week later it would be dead. We couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And right.
Yep. Yeah, we uh, we went down that road when we started building these kits. We actually were building some for uh, some of the tribal, and we were going to build some for some CERT organizations. And we had a, a document that was created saying that uh, we're going to loan you this piece of equipment out at the tribe. And we would like you to at least once a month check in on our nets. And then we would also like you to bring it back quarterly for updates. In case we, you know, we change the fleet map or whatever, the battery, check, test the battery to find out if the battery is actually holding, you know, the charge that they need. And if you don't do that, we're gonna pull it back. Well, it didn't happen. We have no idea where they are. We don't know where they went. That was what you know. We 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 call the, the the people at the tribe and said, "Hey, you know, we got this radio equipment out there. We'd like you to bring it back so we can update it." Oh, we don't know where that's at. So we've decided that we are willing to have classes. If you've got a group in a community, uh, a, a cert group or whatever, we'll bring it out. We'll train it on, train you with it, and if you need it. We have no problem sending it to you in a, in a real disaster, uh, knowing that, 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 you know, it's a need, but we just don't, we can't afford to lose. Each, this, this box here is $6,000, you know, and it's just, you know, we can't, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's sad that it ended up that way because we did have plans to distribute some uh, around the communities, but, you know, uh, some of the things going on with some of the Third organizations are very active. Some are not active. You know, it, it's it, it got it got too confusing and too uh, risky to lose you know equipment. But no, if you've got a group of you know a, a neighborhood watch group that's got radio operators, my gosh, please reach out to me. We'd love to would love to train people. Because we know, we know we do not have enough people. We're going to be reaching out to Palo Alto Radio Club, Papa System, React, you know, other groups, because we, we know we do not have enough radio operators when something really big and major goes down. It's going to be a fact. And it's, and it's a deal. That, okay, we've got a nice core group of people. But then when the disaster happens, we figure that we're only going to see 20% of those at best because they're gonna be taking care of their family. They can't get to where we need them. You know, all these different things are gonna play into the, to the mix that um, we just know that we won't have, but it may be 20% of our, our, our group. So that's why community partnerships are critical. And that's why we train uh, shelter managers in all the cities and so forth with the, the city folks, because we know that uh, we do not have all the resources at one time, the county told us that we need to be prepared to open up uh, was it 24 shelters. Well, we can't open up a shelter without a shelter manager, two, at least two shelter workers, so say three people. And you got to run those uh, multiple shifts. You run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It won't take long to wear out your volunteers. It's just, you know, so we know. Uh, Gentleman with the hat on, yep. <laughs> what well, we have kind of, the reason behind the HT, because we know the HT is very limited on what range it, it can, can hit. That's why we put a log periodic antenna in the HT antenna bag and with a, with a GPS so they could, you know, kind of hone their signal directly at a repeater or at a headquarter. But our main purpose for those is if we're in a shelter and we're out in a distance, we would have a, 
uh, a DST radio operator, DST stands for Disaster Services Technology, uh, wandering or, or attached at the hip with the shelter manager. So the shelter manager says, uh, I need 120 more cots. Well, the person that's shadowing the, sh the shelter manager would relay that information to a comms person, say in the comms trailer or on one of the VHF kits with 50 watts. So they would have a, a little simplex network at the shelter and then the, then the operator would then communicate that down to, to our San Diego chapter. That's the purpose of the HT. Just short range, we know we're not gonna get long distance out of, out of good communications with an HT, but that's mostly in keeping contact. Yeah. Yep. Mark? Yeah, I was just wondering, I heard you compare your pricing working through ICS. How do you fit into ICS? We do. We follow the ICS. The, the Red Cross has a, um, a doctrine called concept of operation, CONOPS, is what we call it, and we train on it, but it follows uh, the ICS system. And we do the ICS 205, we do all those type of things. Uh, we practice uh, We practice sending out, for us, the big form that everybody, in our world, if you want something, you can't get it unless you submit what we call a 6409, a requisition. And if you don't give me a 6409, you don't get anything. So we've actually practiced using the wind link with the HF and the VHF and transmitting the 6409, because it's built right into the WinLink program. Uh, if you go down, it's down on the drop down for Red Cross. And we've sent that, we've sent situational awareness forms back and forth uh, using uh, WinLink just to get people from, and it was really funny, funny because we had an actual uh, disaster drill last year. And we actually were a region. Uh, we are the San Diego or the Southern California region, which is Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, uh, San Diego and Imperial counties, that's our, our region. And we actually had a simulation where, you know, the phones went down and we actually had a person in Orange County transmit a message down to our uh, chapter CDOC. And then we handed them a uh, written, because we had a printer in the, in the, uh, the, in the um, chapter radio room. And we handed them a written note from somebody like, how'd you get this? I said, you know, came in through the uh, uh, through amateur radio. And they were very impressed. So we're getting there, but it's still a long road. You know, to hope. Is there a minimum requirement for volunteers? Is there an expectation of requirement? No. Uh, the key word volunteer. If you can. Are you four hours a month? No. No. There's no. There's no set, we'd love to have you come to the, the monthly meetings, which is nine till noon, because uh, we do training, we do different things on different pieces of equipment. Uh, so yeah, no, it, there's no minimum requirement. You sign up there, you have to take a, you know, uh, disaster, disaster services 101 and one other class, and you don't have to take really anything else. If you want to do DST, then we've got different classes you know, D DST on a disaster operation, which is a three hour video uh, online. You know, it's a type of deal online because we have found, and we used to have this whole list. Oh my God, you have to take all these classes and a volunteer would get started and they say, oh, this is too much work. And I'm done, I don't want to do all this. So we have found out at least with disaster services, technology is get the minimum, so they know what they're doing and how to survive on a DRO. And then everything else goes on the job. Because when you know disaster is ever the same and everything's gonna be different on every disaster you go to. So it's gonna be on the job training is the most valuable thing. So why go all this stuff when it may not even apply when you get there, you know? So it's, it's, it's we've learned lessons over the years and the pandemic has pushed a lot of stuff out to online learning like you know schools and other things uh, it's an ever-evolving 
when I first started, you know, it was, it was very manual, very training class, in, 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 you know, um, a lot, a lot of training classes and so forth. But uh, as time has evolved, you know, there are some things if you're going to deploy, you know, because you will be given like a credit card because you, the Red Cross covers your expenses, fly there. Uh, again, you may, you may sleep in a hotel, you may sleep on a cot in a staff shelter. And, uh, you know, they pay for uh, your meals, your flight, your laundry, if you need to, you know, laundry your clothes, all that type of stuff. But you do work 12 hour days. You put in 12 hours and, and you're expected to say for two weeks. I mean, if we're going to fly you to Florida, you know, for two or three days, it, it's not worth, you know, the value to the Red Cross. So they expect you to stay for two weeks. Used to be three. We've backed it down to two. And uh, it, it, it's never evolving. And we've had people who've gone for two and we don't see them for six weeks. They just keep extending and extending and extending. And mostly it's retired folks, of course. Uh, you're not going to get <laughs> six weeks off to, to, to go, you know, do a disaster somewhere. But no, we've had people, you know, up in, uh, in um, Northern California, we've got people here from San Diego that's been up there for at least four weeks. You know, because the need is there. The need just continues to, to roll through. Somehow the batteries got charged. Okay. I won't admit to anything. <laughs> now, the building was shut down, but we still had, you know, Cardex cars to be able to get in the door. So some people would slip in under the cover of darkness and charge stuff up, as well as the power box. And some of us took, you know, kits home and stored kits at home and kept them charged as well. But yeah, no. Because with the Coast Guard artillery, when we started to go back to the, the station here at Oceanside, uh, the, one of the handhelds was wood power on. Yeah. Power on, take it off the cradle, it's done. Yeah. Destroy a few batteries. Yeah. Yep. I won't admit to anything. Okay. But they, they we, had a, we had a couple of folks that kept things going. Just, you know, and, and even on, and during the pandemic, uh, our DAT teams, we still, but we would we did things differently. We would uh, do a lot of video calls with the clients. Uh, we would video call with like uh, a battalion chief that was on scene of a home fire. They would walk through the structure and kind of show us what the damages were. Uh, so we could, we had an idea what the losses were. Then we could work with the uh, the. Uh, the family, we could commun communicate with the family over the phone and, and through video calls. And, and of course they had to have some documentation to show they actually lived there uh, type of a deal. And then we would prepare the, the what we call them, cat cards, a credit card. And then we would take it and then we would just put it on the hood of the Red Cross vehicle. They would come pick it up. So there was no contact. Uh, unfortunately, it was a sad time, but because uh, the contact and just sometimes all the people need is a hug. Couldn't do it, you know, because of the COVID limitations. So, so we still did that calls. Fires didn't stop. You know, people were still having uh, needs for emergency services, and we just we just kept it going a different way. Other questions? Nothing online. Yeah, the Anytone 878. 878. Yeah. It's a, it's, for us, it's a really good radio because it does several things. Uh, it does all of our analog. It does, our, it does DMR. Again, I, I, when I first tried DMR, I was excited as, as, as could be. I'm not quite as, as excited as I was in, in the beginning. But with the 878, we can also program, program in some of our commercial uh, 
radio frequencies. Some of the national licensed commercial frequencies can be programmed into the radio and used. We haven't had the need for it here. We do have some national uh, radios that are programmed to the national frequencies. And of course, uh, every vehicle that uh, is what we call ERV, emergency response vehicle, has a, a low band radio 47.42, which is the national uh, Red Cross frequency nationwide. So if we ship vehicles from San Diego to, to Florida, when they get there, they can communicate with, with the people there. It's, it's a national frequency, 47.42, low band. It's amazing how well it works, Chris. Oh yeah, yeah, the battery lasts forever. When you, when you drain it down, it takes forever to charge it back up too. Any other? Thank you again. I appreciate you know the invitation. Uh, yeah. Thank you. If you got questions, you want to come up and look at them, uh, please feel free to take a you know. Yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> All right, thanks again, great presentation, very informative. Um, one quick announcement, uh, we do have next month's program lined up. It is going to be on tea hunting from the San Diego tea hunters, Joe and Joe, two Joes, three Joes, I, I don't know. There's too many Joes around here. <laughs> um, so, and they're going to be uh, talking about tea hunting. We haven't had one of those presentations, I think since before COVID. So it'll be good to have them back here talking about tea hunting. Uh, they'll probably have some, um, some foxes to show off and maybe do a, a mini something in the room. We'll see, we'll find out next month. And they're also gonna be talking about the um, later, it's later in May, right? The, the San Diego tea, May, May 20 something. Uh, it'll be in the scope and they will talk about it at great length next month. So uh, thanks for everybody who's here. Thanks to everybody who's joining us online and uh, good night. Uh, feel free to peruse the stuff up here, but we're going to close the uh, Zoom meeting. Oh, Dennis, yes. Yeah, yeah, we did announce that, yeah. Yes, the ears auction... The flyer will be on the by the by the laptop here if you want to take a picture of it, and we will uh, have it in the scope next month. All right. Good night.